All right, good morning, everyone. It says it's 6.58 on my clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started so that we can get everything done this morning. Um, if you are coming to the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast, you're right in the right place. I'm Christina Corral, I'm statewide soil health and cover crop educator, and I'm actually housed up in uh, Lake County up in Baldwin. So welcome, and let's get this morning started. So with that, we're going to start right in. I'm Dr. Kurt Steinke, who's our associate professor at our uh, Soil Fertility and Nutrient Management. Um, he's going to talk about side dress nitrogen in corn. All right. Thank you, Christina. So uh, thank you for joining us uh, here this morning. A uh, bit of a weird morning. I had to get up and shut the blinds here in the office because the sun's starting to peek through. We haven't seen too many days of that here as of late. So Going to cover a couple items uh, here this morning, uh, predominantly looking at side dress nitrogen and corn. Now, obviously, we come up with this, these topics and speaker schedules not knowing what spring is going to look like, right? So a lot of us probably um, are in the process of planting and side dress may not be at the forefront of our mind, but it is the middle of May, nearing the end of May, and it will be here before we know it. So a couple things. Uh, start off with so far. Uh, spring, 22 thus far. So obviously probably the seed and perhaps the fertilizer stayed in the bag or shop a little longer than we would like, right? Um, can't predict what spring is going to look like, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I know a lot of us think we're probably behind uh, with regards to previous years. Our memory goes back one year and last year we were all wrapped up quite early in the spring season based on how uh, dry it was uh, last April, May, and early part of June. But if you look at, you know, if I'll look at uh, South Central Michigan here, and, you know, this, this probably plays out across a pretty wide swath of the state. You look at, you know, March, we had about two and a half inches of rain here, which is above our 30-year uh, mean at 1.8. April, about four, which is also above the 30-year mean. May, prior to yesterday, about 1.6. I think we had about a third of an inch or so here. So we're probably around two. So sitting just under that 30-year mean halfway through the month. So, you know, it, it, it's been a little wet out there, um, but that's probably not the whole story, right? Uh, it hasn't been overly wet. The problem is that that big orange ball in the sky just hasn't come out. So if you look at that max two inch soil temperature in April really didn't even reach 50 degrees Fahrenheit uh, on 15 of 30 days in the month of April. That tells you a little bit on how cool it was over the month of April and probably a little bit how cloudy it was also. You look at that minimum two inch soil temp in April, stayed less than 40 degrees on 23 of 30 days and it was just cloudy, right? So, you know, we were slightly above, above average with regards to precipitation and we just never got to dry out. And so we just couldn't get in the field. And so everything got a little bit delayed. Now, a lot of us are probably maybe catching our breath a little bit um, after the last week and a half, you know, things slowly appear to be catching up. Um, and so again, we'll be at that side dress time here before we know it. When you look at corn nitrogen strategies in general, right? There really is not one correct strategy. You start looking at the mix of uh, pre-plants, you look at at plant, whether it's starter, um, whether it's pre's, you know, some of us refer to pre's as blow and go, uh, that would be after planting, but before emergence. And then we have side dress. So a lot of us use a combination of those uh, four strategies, right? And there is no one right or wrong strategy. A lot of it will depend on the weather and we have to be able to adjust. But oftentimes, you know, you kind of get pigeonholed in a corner that those doing split applications might be more efficient. And those doing pre-plants may be less efficient. Well, it depends, right? It depends on your, def on, on your definition of efficiency. From a nutrient efficiency perspective, oftentimes splits may pay. We'll talk about when that occurs, but a lot of that has to do with the weather. But you also have to consider the business efficiency and the economic efficiency, right? And as farms get bigger and we all get busier, a lot of us have switched to pre-plant or at plant fertilizer applications. So when you start talking about doing the right thing and for our nutrient management, the end timing is one singular component, right? All these components, you talk about the source, the rate, the time, the place, all those components intertwine uh, to influence that optimal soil fertility program. 
So we'll start with why would we even consider side dressing corn, right? If you can put it all on early, why would you even consider side dressing corn? Well, you know, we might be in the midst of one of these reasons. Let's look at a wet spring, right? So we might have substantial losses of our pre-plan incorporated in, or perhaps our pre-end. Again, that pre-end is often what we refer to um, as after planting, but prior to emergence. And you can look at uh, other reasons, time, right? Maybe we're busy uh, with other planting going on, trying to get soys in the ground, trying to get beets in the ground, et cetera. So we don't have time uh, to put end down early um, or we're perhaps managing other crops. You look at wheat, wheat is rocketing out of the ground right now. A lot of our wheat's at uh, flag leaf already. Um, and so are we busy putting fungicide on so we don't have time to put fertilizer on early? These are all uh, uh, issues that have to be dealt with uh, early in the season. Side dress may allow for quicker planning, right? You don't have time to slow down the planter. Maybe you don't have time to do two by twos, pre's, et cetera. That would be another reason. And the last one probably be weather patterns or weather variability. You talk about spring is typically the time of year with the greatest end losses. Um, for corn, the month that really influences us is June. Um, you look at opportunities to account for spring end loss. That would be another reason to side dress. And you start considering Michigan soils, that weather variability tends to become a bit of a larger factor than some of our surrounding states based on how those weather patterns and fronts move through Michigan and uh, their influence by the surrounding Great Lakes. You start looking at rainfall variability. This is the old graph that I put on a lot of my extension talks that I update every year. You look at the month of June, right? And this goes back uh, about 16 or 17 years, if I do my math right here. I consider anything 33% uh, less than or 33% above normal to be excessively wet or dry. And so you can see the month of June going back, anything in red is excessively uh, dry, anything in green is excessively wet, and anything in black would be uh, within those boundaries and considered normal. And June's been all over the board, you know, kind of looks like a Christmas tree right here. Um, it's more often excessively wet or dry than it is normal. I mean, look back. The last couple of Junes, look at June of 21, you know, we were dry here in the Lansing area for about two and a half, three weeks, and then we got eight inches in three days. June of 19, very similar pattern. June of 20, uh, more of that normal range. You go back a couple of years, it's been excessively dry. So June is a month that has been quite variable here the last several years. So one question I always throw out to people is, do we have a better idea on how that season's gonna look at planning time or 40 days after plant. And oftentimes the answer is usually when we get to near side dress time, we have a little better indication how that growing season is gonna look. Now, not, that's not always the case. You look at last year was a bit of a curveball because right about side dress time, it was still relatively dry up till that third or fourth week in June, right? And then we got a little rain and then it stayed moist pretty much the rest of that growing season. We had a large slug of end mineralized towards the end of the season that really assisted with corn yields across the state. But in general, we tend to have a little better indication on if it's gonna be a warm, cold, wet, dry, excessive, or uh, uh, et cetera, growing season when we get to that side dress time. Now you start looking at what our goal is of in-season nine applications. And this is, you know, in general, we'll, we'll, we'll look at side dress here. You know, our goal is to better synchronize and availability in the ground with corn and uptake, right? And so you can look at that end uptake by growth stage between emergence and V2, we're only looking at about 3% of our total end gets uptaken by the plant. Between V2 and V6, about 7%. So if you're sitting at V6 corn, you can add these numbers up to get to that cumulative 100%. At V6, we're only sitting at about 10% of our end uptake has occurred. Now, what really changes is that V6 to V10 period, right? About a fifth of our end gets uptaken, and then about a third gets uptaken between V10 and V14. So by the time we hit R1, right, or tassel, we're sitting on about, you know, 67, 70% of our corn and has been uptaken by the plant. So that's why that side dress timing is a key component because you're just about to hit that period of growth where end uptake really skyrockets, right? And so we have the ability 
if, if the stand is good, emergence is good, is even, do we adjust upwards, do we adjust downwards, et cetera. So when we talk about conventional side dress, typically it's gonna be that V4 to V6 window. Now you start talking about some delayed end applications in Michigan, probably be more towards that V10 and after, right? V11, V12, knocking on the door of tassel. But side dress is not necessarily better than pre-plant, right? It's not about growers that side dress, are more efficient, uh, more environmentally aware than those that do pre-plant. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of it boils down to the weather, right? So we have to look at that weather variability and, you know, why? If I look back at, you know, our single pass pre-plant systems versus multi-pass systems, this is a study I wrapped up with one of my PhD students a couple of years back and looking at corn grain yield. Looking at 2014, 15, and 16, 2014 and 15, we saw a significant anywhere from nine to 31 uh, bushel of the acre yield increases doing a multi-pass application. That multi-pass was something pre-plant or at plant with that side dress. In 2016, we didn't see any difference across the board, right? So why do we get this variability in single versus multi-pass and application systems? Go back to this weather chart and look at that weather. In 14 and 15, we had very wet Junes. In 2016, it was very dry. Right? So if I go back to this chart in 14 and 15, very wet Junes, that's where we saw that benefit to that side dress or that split application. In 2016, when June was very dry, we get much poorer use of our nitrogen that is applied. So we didn't see much difference between that pre-plant versus multi-pass application system. Now, other things to consider, that split in application often pays off when? One, coarse textured soils, right? So if you're on a sandy textured soil, might be a loamy sand, might be a sandy loam. Typically we, we group these into about a CC of five and under, but I'd probably be willing to budge that up when you start looking at some of your sandy loams up to about probably a CEC of seven. In some cases I've seen those about a CEC of eight. Those are often when those end applications may pay off because we get a little greater end movement through the soil, right? It's a little bit more mobile through that system than our fine textured soils. Where do we see it pay off with our fine textured soils? Those would be uh, uh, those, those finer textured, tighter, soil, tighter soils that have a history of end losses, right? And those end losses would be predominantly denitrification. So we're looking at some of those poorly drained, fine textured soils. Now, this is interesting. You start looking at fields that are tile drained versus ones that are not tile drained. Oftentimes we assume if we're well tiled and we're well drained, we need a little bit more nitrogen because we have the proper growing conditions. But actually, when you look at data, I just saw some data uh, out of Michigan, just saw some data out of Minnesota. It actually looks like if you're well tiled and drained, we actually can get away with a little lower amounts of nitrogen. Why? Because we don't get that denitrification. We don't have that standing water. And so those fine textured soils with those history of end losses typically uh, are those ones that pay off with that split end application. Pre-plant applications might possibly be better than side dress when typically our fine textured soils that are higher in organic matter. So when I look at data across the uh, upper Midwest, the North Central States, it's those soils that are higher in organic matter, fine textured, so we're not talking about sands, um, and higher in organic matter, we're probably talking mid threes and higher, maybe low threes and higher with regards to organic matter. Those are the ones that typically have a little bit more wiggle room or buffer uh, room with regards uh, to N availability. The other thing to think about is depth, right? So you start talking about some of these fine textured soils that are higher in organic matter. Oftentimes they're a little bit deeper of a profile. Right. So if you start talking about Illinois, for instance, you're talking about maybe a four and a half to six foot mollusol. You have a little bit more wiggle room with regards to N because it's a deeper profile, right? Than maybe some of the alpha sols, spodosols, et cetera, in Michigan, which might only be, you know, let's say 38, 45, maybe 48 inches deep total. Not all that is going to be, uh, uh, that plant may not be able to root in that entire profile either. So those are things to consider. Take a look at that depth, take a look at that organic matter, and then take a look at that overall soil texture. So the thing with side dress and application timing would be one, we have to satisfy those early corn end requirements, right? I don't care if you side dress at V4 to six or V10 to a V11 or even later, 
you have to satisfy those early corn end requirements because again, even by about V6, you've taken up about 10% of your total end. So you have to meet that need. And that's where that start right to finish well uh, phrase comes into play, right? You have to get that plant off to a good start. Now you start talking about conventional side dress, maybe versus a late split end side dress. Typically what we've seen in Michigan, that late split end uh, may not always offer advantages. Now, obviously it's gonna be field specific, site specific, weather specific. But a couple things to remember, if you do go with a late split end, and here I'd be talking about V10 and later, you have to have sufficient end until that side dress application timing, because that'll really impact the success of that side dress. The other thing is you need water, right? So you still need water for end to move to roots. And so this is one thing we've run into in Michigan is when we get to these later side dress application timings, oftentimes the precipitation shuts off, and we can't get that end to the plant. So we get poor use of the end and we don't see uh, that optimal uh, corn performance with regards to that late citrus end, end application. We also have to consider that positional unavailability of nitrogen. What do I mean by that? If you're putting N on the soil surface later in that vegetative cycle and we don't get water, that end may stay on the soil surface and can risk a few end losses. The other thing to consider, Late split end applications, again, that V10 or so and later, and rescue end are not similar. Rescue end is when we're in one of those uh-oh scenarios where it's very wet in the spring. We can't get out to side dress at all. Yes, in that case, try to get that rescue on as soon as you can. Late split end is not the same thing. It's a little bit different. With regards to rescue end, if you can get it out by tassel time, usually you'll see that corn payoff after tassel, typically we don't see those payoffs occur. So remember with regards to that two by two, add plant continues to offer more consistent grain yield. 40 N uh, uh, pounds of N in a two by two is not sufficient to delay that side dress to V11 across many Michigan soils. Other states it is because they're higher in organic matter. We have not seen that in Michigan. You're gonna need a greater rate for that two by two if you're gonna go up that V10, V11 and later uh, for that citrus application. A couple pictures, we'll get close to wrapping up here. You look at that top picture, 175 units then at V4 last year, bottom 175 units at, at V12. Again, we saw about a 6% increase in grain yield just by choosing the right citrus date and setting that plant up well. When we looked at V4 alone at top versus 40 units of N in a two by two with a little bit at V4, same total N rate. We saw reductions this last year with that two by two and Y. You couldn't use that two by two because it was so dry this last growing season. With that V12, same thing, right? We didn't see good use of that starter last year because we had about a half inch of rain over the course of about eight weeks. But look at that bottom picture there. When we went with that V12 and increased that two by two to about 80 units of N, that's when we really start to see those yield increases with that late vegetative side dress. So typically if you go with that V10 or later, you're gonna be probably at least about 60 to 80 units of N to get that corn plant to that point in time. So just remember that number in your head as we all head out into the field. Other considerations during side dress time, sulfur, right? Uh, so that might be one thing. If you didn't get any sulfur on, apply that sulfur as close to crop need to reduce that chance for S leaching losses including sulfur tends to be a little bit more efficient than trying to correct a sulfur deficiency. All right, so Jim Camberato and I and Sean Castile at Purdue are coming out with a sulfur bulletin. We should have that out uh, mid-season here, look at sulfur across all the field crops. This is how it generally will look in that upper right-hand corner picture. You'll see a little bit general yellowing and a little bit of striping. Also a good time to look for some potassium issues right? Because right about citrus time is when some of those potassium issues will begin to show up. As always, take a look at your overall end rate. End prices really haven't budged much. Corn prices budged up as we all have seen that ratio right now sitting at about 0.13. And again, if you don't care about economics, typically those end rates over in that far left-hand column will be the ones that tend to be non-limiting for that overall corn production. So with that, I will wrap it up. I will stick around uh, here for a while yet to answer any questions. Kurt, I know you answered the first one, but we do have several on the phone, so I can't read it. So the first question from iPhone was, what are your thoughts on Y-drop application at V10 to V11? 
Yeah, that was a good question. You know, we looked at wide drops for a number of years. Uh, some of my colleagues have looked at wide drops. And, you know, it, it really gets into uh, the issue of can you predict whether there's going to be precipitation when you apply the nitrogen, right? So when you look at placing an on the ground, as compared to like Coulter inject, right, where you place it in the ground, there's undoubtedly many times more soil moisture in the ground, right? So when you got to put that in in the ground with the moisture to get that end to the plant. So when you place it on the ground, it tends to be a little quicker. So I see why a lot of growers do it. it, tends to be a little bit more efficient from that standpoint because you can be quicker. But the problem we run into is if you don't get precipitation, then we still don't get that end to the plant. Um, and so when you put it on the ground and you don't get that precipitation and we do get this pattern where it's dry and it's sunny and it's warm, what tends to happen is you run the risk of volatilizing a little bit more in and you put that in right in a position where it's on the surface and it's subject to that uh, uh, sunrise and sunshine uh, each and every day, right? So you can actually lose a little bit more in. So we tended to call that the positional unavailability of nitrogen right when that occurs. Now, if, you, if you're irrigated, it's not an issue. If you happen to get a rain, a significant rain, uh, or you know at least a quarter, quarter to a half inch to push that end from the surface into the ground, then that will, that will uh, alleviate some of those issues. Um, but you look at the patterns we've been in the last decade, decade and a half, that tends to become one of those issues. So it, again, it's not about something is right versus something is wrong. It's you really got to look at what kind of weather pattern you're sitting in at that late vegetative stage. So we've seen a little better response with that Coulter inject uh, than we have with Y drops. But again, a lot of that boiled down to whether we had precipitation or not. Thank you. Um, the next question for you, Kurt, um, is regards to no-tilling and applying urea on the top um, of the soil. Do you recommend a nitrogen stabilizer used on both application if you split apply? Um, you have do you apply at or before planting and at knee high corn? Um, this person applies 100, 100 pounds on and after planting and the rest at knee high. So that's a good question. Typically, when we surface apply our nitrogen, yes, you want to use some sort of urease inhibitor. There's many of them out there. Some work better than others, right? Um, so when you surface apply that end, yes. Again, one of the things we have to be aware of is the later you apply that nitrogen, so if you surface apply pre-plant, yes, undoubtedly, typically something like urease inhibitor uh, tends to work under those conditions. Now, as you get into uh, the growing season and you surface apply that and let's say it's V4, V6, V8 corn, you don't necessarily want that end to be, to be tied up for a long period of time. So you start talking about nitrification inhibitors, probably not the best idea at that point in time. But if you surface apply that end, it still may be uh, uh, worthwhile to use something like a urease inhibitor because you can volatilize that end off the soil surface relatively quickly. Again, the question becomes, take a look at that forecast and how sure are we that we are or are not going to see a rainfall after you surface apply that nitrogen. So most of those urease inhibitors that are out there will protect that end from volatilization for probably, depending on what you use, 10 to maybe 18, 19 days, right? Um, and so that, that, that's a pretty lengthy period of time. If you think you're gonna get rainfall maybe within a shorter period of time than that, three to seven days out, it may not pay off. One of the other caveats to using a urease inhibitor um, that really doesn't get discussed a whole lot is, you know, urea, if you use it with something like urea, urea is an, an uncharged molecule. So when you use that urease inhibitor, it keeps urea in that urea end form for a longer period of time. So what we've seen uh, is when you use something like that on urea and you get a big rainfall in big, I think the biggest we've seen or the lowest big rainfall we've seen is probably about 1.3, 1.4 inches. We've actually seen that end move downwards through that soil profile a little bit quicker because it's uncharged, right? So it can move a little bit quicker. So that becomes a little bit of a risk factor. Right? So there's benefits to all these types of products. There's a couple negatives. It's not just an insurance mechanism. You really have to hone in on that. Big take home point here probably is as you get later in the season 
after planting. And as that corn continues to push out of the ground and grow, you probably don't want to hold that end back for too long of a period because there are some instances you can keep it from transforming to soluble in uh, uh, for a lengthy period of time, which is maybe not something you want. All right. Thank you. So the next question that Phil asks, Jeff, for you, and it's one of those, if you need to get your crystal ball out and stick your neck on the line, because who wants to to answer this question, but do you have a long-term outlook for the summer? The lucky silver dollar. That's, that's yes. Go-to. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and it's interesting. There actually, there is going to be a new outlook. Uh, we get to one of these once a month uh, here in another hour. But the going thought is for uh, for the, the summer is that La Nina is going to stick around in the Pacific. It's longer, it's stronger than, than anybody had, uh, had expected earlier. And it will be with us for the next few months, probably though, not much of an impact as we move into the summer. The, the general expectation is though for no, uh, normal to above normal. So maybe milder than normal mean temperatures. And, and at least for the first part of the season, normal to above normal precipitation totals for the, uh, the next couple of months. Uh, beyond that, warmer than normal, but with no direction of precipitation for the latter half of the summer. That's That's been where we've been. And a lot of the, uh, again, the upper Midwest Great Lakes region falls into that, that category. So out of all that, I would say, again, especially the, the warmer than normal mean temperatures are, have been consistent. And at least for the, the upcoming several weeks, the towards the wetter than normal also. Uh, but we will see, we'll, we'll look at this next Next week we'll have have new new data and see if there are any changes. But it's been it's been fairly consistent for the last couple of months. So, Chris, uh, Dr. Defonso, do you have an update for insects that we need to to keep our eyes out for or be prepared for? Sorry, I just got pictures of millipedes eating seeds, so I was immersed in that. Um, yeah, so this transport event that Jeff is tra- is talking about. We had a uh, catch of black cutworm that was pretty heavy on campus from yesterday. So that would be an intensive catch. So in the central Michigan area, or if you're trapping for black cutworm, you add about 300 degree days to that. And that is a timing for potential cutting. So on the, um, the trapping website that we have, you can actually play it and see that that population has moved across Indiana. And now we're getting the high trap catches here in Michigan. I see some others are trapping uh, extension agent in the thumb. And it looks like uh, maybe Paul Gross or Monica are trapping in central Michigan or maybe you, Christina. And those numbers have, have come up. Uh, true army worm like nothing just that just hasn't quite moved yet but we could have a potato leafhopper event if jeff is talking about a movement event and those also get kind of dumped uh kind of uh, over us in these kind of transport events um other than that just been pretty quiet i'm getting questions about ticks and stuff and we talked about that before people came on and about that the tick load is uh tremendous this year and again that's what happens when you don't have winter so we all think it's nice not to have that those cold temperatures in the winter, but but those used to shield us from uh, some of these things that were killed or diminished over the hard winters, which we don't seem to have anymore. That's about it. Other, other than that, it's been kind of quiet. So along with that, uh, Kim, Kim, Dr. Cassida, um, if you're on, can you talk a little bit about winter kill and alfalfa or what? Or- what these hoppers are going to mean to our forage? Alfalfa in general is uh, is seeing the same uh, surging growth that uh, was described for other crops such as wheat. Um, we're probably going to be a little bit late on our first cut in some parts of the state still because it has a lot of catching up to do because of that cold snap. So that may affect our insect populations. Chris might be a better one to uh, tell us how that would specifically affect us. But one of the things that we've seen around here that is notable this spring is we don't seem to have very many alfalfa weevils um, around. So that's good. Yeah, nor- normally, and winter kill. Of, normally at yeah. this time of the year, Kim, I could go out to your plots and at least see them. Even yeah. and, and a little bit of feeding, and 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 you and I did not have not seen that yet, so no. kind of interesting. It's, it's a little odd, so it is interesting. I don't, I don't, I'm not. When you brought it to my attention, I've been looking for them ever since, and they're 
really not, they don't seem to be around in the Lansing area. Um, in regard to winter kill, um, I have had some reports of winter kill and alfalfa around the state. Um, I think actually what we're seeing in some of those cases, it's not traditional winter kill caused by cold temperature. It's actually uh, caused by uh, very long-term soil saturation that we've seen from the high rainfall. And that has uh, caused some plants to drown basically. So some of that might've been ice sheeting uh, where we had freezing, but uh, we've seen some interesting fields this spring. Kim, what would you recommend as far as those spots in the field, or if you have fields that do have the winter kill, uh, what annual forage is what you recommend for our producers that need that extra forage? Well, if you want to overseed alfalfa with an annual um, and get maximum yield, one of our best options is Italian ryegrass. Uh, and that's one that you can plant a little bit later. We've kind of missed the window we would normally recommend to go out and overseed an alfalfa stand because it was too wet to get on them. Um, so at this point, your best option would be to go in after first cut if you want to overseed. Uh, do that as quickly as possible after you get the, uh, the haylage or hay off so that you're not running over those new shoots. Um, it's not the optimal time to, to overseed, but it can be successful. Are there any specialists on the call that have an update? Marty, I see you're on. Is there anything that you you feel that we all need to know? Um, so in our wheat, it's, it, we're at flag leaf here on campus, um, but disease-wise, we're pretty quiet. Um, so I guess if I was trying to maximize my economic returns, I would perhaps skip that flag leaf application and just save it for the uh, head scab application to protect from head scab while also giving, you know, some protection to that flag leaf. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I've seen in wheat so far, pretty quiet on the disease front. So Marty, if, if producers are really trying to maximize yield, because I look at the price on wheat right now, never seen it this high before. So I think every bushel is going to be, uh, <laughs> they're gonna try for every bushel that's out there. So, would you recommend that they go ahead and use a fungicide on this flag leaf or not? Um, no, I know. <clears throat> That's what, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But at the moment, <clears throat> what I was saying is that I would personally wait until that head scab timing. Okay. When you make that head scab timing, you're going to get protection of that flag leaf. Um, you know, as long as we don't have something like stripe rust blow in, and we haven't seen stripe rust um, this year in Michigan. Um, and the septoria seems to be pretty quiet as well. Um, Jeff's, you know, two week prediction of sort of uh, warm and wet um, and this precip that's coming up does certainly speak to the potential for a head scab uh, developing. So that's personally that what I would be doing if it was my farm. Thank you. Um, I see no other questions. If anybody ha else has anything to add, please go ahead. Christina, Thanks. I think so we're all set for today. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Be safe out there and try to stay dry.